It's freaking cold. You got frostbite yet? In the frigid Canadian north, young pilots seeking adventure. That's why all those guys are up here. Battle the elements in World War II planes. Oh, bitch. On this episode, Scott gets his baptism by fire. Two, one, all three, now. Joe heads back home. A lot of dreams dreamt out here. Arnie surprises oh. everyone. Holy, you sexy beast! And Mikey goes to Washington. Out of your hats, boy. It's a windy, dry start to summer in northern Canada. And wildfires are raging. The town of Slave Lake is under siege. All 7,000 residents are fleeing. Two hundred and fifty kilometers north at the Fort McMurray Airport, four of Buffalo CL-215 water bombers sit in the smoky haze, ready to fight the biggest fire in Buffalo's history. It may be a nightmare, but newly trained water bomber pilot Scott Blue is anxious to fight the flames. You're taking a plane and you're going to Fort McMurray. I was like, wow, okay. High winds are feeding the fires. and they're now threatening to engulf the nearby oil sands facilities. All of a sudden, you know, the alarm goes off, dispatch, dispatch. When you get dispatched, it's so time sensitive and they want you there right away. Start them up. Scott will be flying with veteran captain Bert Weaver. They'll be piloting a plane Buffalo just purchased from the Newfoundland government. At that point, you don't even know where you're going. Buffalo pilot Alex Wagner will be going ahead, flying the bird dog. Alex will coordinate all the water bombers. Uh, give me two, it's uh, bird dog 101. The job of a bird dog is a control tower around the forest fire. Any communication between either helicopters or water bombers are all being brought to the bird dog, which is sitting higher up. Bird dog, you consider a shepherd, and we're the sheep, really. Right there. Gotcha. Yeah, I just want to know uh, which tanker is uh, head of the pack. Okay, 282 is in the lead. Then. Not only is this Scott's first fire mission, he's co pilot in the lead plane and literally learning on the fly. Can okay, we just uh, scan the water here? Of course, I was a little jittery and nervous because I didn't know the proper calls or timing. I mean, this is all new to me. Uh, not this one, but this one. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's good. Broke down. Broke down. Scott and Bert head to the lake for their first scoop. Small probes under the belly of the plane scoop up the water, filling the two 2,700-liter reservoir tanks in just 10 seconds. The sudden flood of water on board changes the aerodynamics of the plane. And it takes expert airmanship to control it. Okay. Going arm. Done. I just want to be as perfect as it can be in the plane. But Scott has a lot to learn before he's anywhere near perfect. The scooping itself should remain the same. What makes it harder, though, is all those five or six other aircrafts and the radio cons. <laughs> Scotty's there and trying to baby the engines. There's a lot of work involved in that. It's a different world from what it was used to before. Scott's inexperience is already showing. You're doing bombing in a tight circuit. 
Everything happens so quickly. You don't have time to go to the checklist and read through it. We're not trading anymore. Everything's happening once here. You go for calls and you want them and you expect them. Okay, you guys, you guys, both me. Yeah, we got you there. Okay, we're going to do a nice P turn all the way to final. Uh, just follow me, we'll go to the back uh, over that point there on the left side. That will light us up on the uh, long final. Loaded up with 12,000 pounds of water, Scott and Bert lead the bombers towards the drop zone. Bert is everywhere, right? Yeah. Unreal. Great, uh, 82. Your first drop will be just ahead of the uh, little island of Great Tree. The adrenaline's going, you're watching this, you're watching that. And all you can see out of your cockpit window is just smoke, and then at the very bottom, flame. Roger, 82. They line up for their first drop and head straight for the smoke. The sudden loss of 12,000 pounds of water, combined with updrafts from the flames, can make it very difficult to control the plane. And one one coming to the target. You drop that water, you're talking 25, 30% being gone in a second. Three, two, one, bomb three, now. All of a sudden, it's a heck of a later. Whoa, you know, you don't realize how much you just gotta, hey, down girl, you know, like, I'm the boss here. A good drop, and Scott revs up the engines for a clean getaway. I've heard stories about sparks and uh, things coming into the plane, ashes through the vents. Right, uh, we'll do a left turn through the smoke, back to the lake. Water bombers will go back and forth in the lake, so you get a sequence. So I know which one is coming in which order, and they'll usually keep that order. Caution, 95 and 96 are on their way back. Got them there, straight ahead. Coming down. I thought you were close to the water. That's like where the arc came right off. Just real close? Yeah. Okay. Reloaded, Scott and Bert set up for their second drop. And we'll fall in behind you. But now, the water bombers aren't the only aircraft on the scene. We got uh, one helicopter uh, bucketing uh, right now, and uh, see a bunch of targets there on my uh, TCAS. In the smoke, worst case scenario would be uh, two aircraft colliding, colliding each other. Tiger 282, from 280, uh, that fire off to the railway, I can see a helicopter working out. I thought it was a uh, bird dog, but the helicopter's gonna cover there. I see the helicopter over the fire right now. There's choppers here, there's bird dogs here. And, uh, Tankers are coming in and out. Like it's, it's very important to have visual separation and know where everybody is. But all that traffic can distract a rookie water bomber pilot. Okay, ten flap, ten flap. Two eighty, where are you? Fifteen flap. It's set. Twenty-four hundred. Fifteen flap, twenty-four hundred. All the time. Set. All right, guys, uh, we're coming up on the final. As soon as you enter the smoke, it'll be uh, your drop. And check. Three, two, one. Off the way. Another bullseye. They're hitting their targets, but it's like spitting on a campfire. <laughs> and the fires are getting within a few kilometers of the Alberta oil sands. These tar sands facilities were completely evacuated, equipment just sitting around. There's billions of dollars of infrastructure there just on the cusp of getting annihilated by these wildfires. And all that is standing in the way are firefighters like Scott, Burt, and others on the front lines, trying to stop the unstoppable. Yeah, you bid 23 times, 100, another 100, then another 100. And what was the last one? 285. At the Buffalo Hangar in Yellowknife, Joe McBrien and his boys have found a used CL215 water bomber on eBay. Well, there's a new guy. But does he know that he's not high bid? Yeah. Joe's bought a few of these rare Canadian-made water bombers, but this is not the kind of auction he's used to. 
I understand you owe a bid by telex and by uh, closed bid and by crown asset bid. I was very familiar with that. I mean, we crown ass bid every day on something. What's it, what does ours say? Nothing. It just keeps bidding 100 bucks more for us. It How says, do you know that? It says you are the highest bidder. Right? Done 366 now. They're locked in a bidding war with the mysterious buyer online. All of a sudden, somebody's bidding and it's going up. Like, who is this person? Like, if you're serious, you wouldn't be adding a thousand dollars at a time. So it's not a big guy, but you never know. The plane isn't in mint condition, but then this scooper was built 40 years ago. We've seen one float that had a, needs a fiberglass repair on the nose cone. But if Joe, Rod, and Mikey can get it at a bargain price, it will help with their expansion plans. Our goal is to introduce our system of fight and fire into the United States of America, which is scooping aircraft. This is a military air base in Venezuela. There's the 215, right there. Last year, Mikey tracked down a long lost CL-215 he wanted to buy in Venezuela. Oh, there she is. The deal looked good. Next stop, Yellowknife. But the plane is still sitting in the jungle because of government red tape. Now, Mikey has another chance to bring home a CL215. But first, they have to win the bid. Wow. 370. Oh, 382. 382. Is the same guy? New guy 10 minutes ago. He jumped $77,000 on his first bid. Fixed up, this duck could be worth more than $2 million. But all they have to go by are photos on the internet. Must you add now? He put 391. 769. 401, but same guy. minutes? We're at nine minutes. They've set their maximum bid at $450,000. What they don't know is how high the other bidder will go. The last one he's got to hit her big, eh? He's looking to buy us. He may own her. He's getting nervous now. Is he getting nervous or are you getting nervous? <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes. I'll show you the screen, and we'll stay on that screen. So right now, 4.30. It's come down to this. What's, what's countdown run? 1.45. Don't touch that. Don't or anything. Don't <laughs> One minute. 4.39. Don't touch that. Oh, yeah, you have the same temple you have in there, and you have it at church basement at Bingo, you know. The, it's the, the last hour of Bingo. Oh, he's coming up with another one. 4.42. Yeah. I cover his marker. 445. Put another thousand. 50 seconds. I expect a big one to come in now. You ought to throw 200 on her. Okay, here it comes. 30 seconds starting now. On any auction or bid, till the hammer hits the table, you never know. You, you don't anticipate. He's out of time. 10, 9, 10, 8, 8, 7, 6, like 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Done. Yeah. You wanted it. We bought it. What did it say? Four hundred and forty-five thousand dollars. Four thirty-four Canadian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Same ten grand. <laughs> Same ten grand being Canadian. <laughs> they won the plane at less than a quarter of its market value. A bargain if it's in good condition. This is a we're off North Carolina, eh, Corey? We bought it set on scene. Like there could be huge wing crack in your airplane could be worthless. Uh, the reason why I went so low is because it's a gamble, and that's what we do. Do I really want this airplane, or do I need this airplane? It's like sex. You really want it, but do you really need it? Airplanes. Come on. Now the work begins. They may not be high-fiving when they see what they actually bought. Near Fort McMurray, Alberta, Scott Blue is on his first firefighting job. Fires north of Fort McMurray were enormous and out of control. And when he started seeing how close they were getting to the tar sands, he realized why we were there. 3 2, it's uh, Brick Dog 101. The heat from the flames has created spinning columns of hot air and ash. There were tornadoes on the ground from the fire sucking all the oxygen and spinning the dirt around. Caution for all tankers, uh, a couple of dust devils uh, happening here. 
the actual sand moving around in the air would sandblast the aircraft, possibly, you know, damaging the engines. Nice big one uh, coming on this side of the fire. Watch out. Make it wide. Stay in the clear. The bomber set up for another drop. All right, gentlemen. I don't want to have anybody crossing each other in the face in the smoke down there. Once they enter the smoke, they'll be flying blind. When we fly through the thick smoke, it goes back to flying within our instruments. It's coming up the smoke there. Sometimes you'll lose sight of, of, of ground. It's difficult flying, but Scott is starting to get the hang of it. Good job. You nailed it perfect. I think we're making a difference. As time goes by, just a little experience there, and it's amazing. It can gel really, really well. Okay, guys, uh, that's it for today. Let's uh, get home. The Buffalo pilots return to base. If I fire that intensity, there's shifts on it. You'll have another group of aircraft showing up and replacing you. Take our two-way two. Winds calm. Clear to land. It's tough, demanding flying, and yeah. It, it wears you down. Scott brings in the plane after an intense day, a trial by fire. I think given my level of greenness, which was, you know, Kermit the Frog levels of greenness, it was, uh, I think I did pretty good. I think he did great. He had good positive attitude. He wanted to do the job. Those are the guys that you feel safe with. Mikey McBrien is on a foreign mission to Washington, D.C. That's pretty cool. Didn't our uh, aliens get this building in Independence Day? A lot of history here, a lot of Simpsons references that are now making sense. He's not just here to see the sights. He wants to take Buffalo multinational. Marco! Well, the main reason for me going down to Washington is to make contacts and make, uh, you know, friends and buddies with, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, force system. Whew, freaking hot. He ditches the signature black hoodie for a button-up shirt. Mikey's attending a conference on forest firefighting that attracts delegates from around the world. So what better opportunity than go uh, to a conference with uh, all the, you know, all the wheelers and dealers of, uh, you know, U.S. fighting fire? And he's brought in a guy who knows a lot about the business side of water bombing. Dwayne, Dwayne, good to see you. Buddy. In Washington, I had my secret weapon, which is Dwayne Hicks. You ready for the conference? Yeah, you? Yeah, might as well, let's get her done. His grandfather fought forest fires, his father fought forest fires, and now Dwayne got out of it, now he's back full force with me, and we're gonna go try to fight the world forest fires now. Dwayne is no longer a manager at Buffalo, but Mikey could use his expertise at the conference. How many operational aircraft do you Seven. have? Seven. 5,000 kilos an hour, fuel burn. What's going on here is we've got the Russian, uh, basically a, a jet-powered, uh, you know, scooper similar to our, four, uh, our CL-215. All right, my man. Which is really weird to me is you got the whole state of North Carolina. They can't afford this airplane, but a private company in Northwest Territories, we're going to have eight, nine of them. Since 2005, fire Mikey may find his mind wandering from time to time, but he's determined to land business outside the north. The one thing I really will learn from having you around, there's something outside of the Buffalo bubble. There's stuff outside of Delmay and Norman Wells. Like the world doesn't end, you know, in Hay River. It goes bigger, right? There's bigger things out there. We yeah. will never have gone to alert if no. you weren't there. No. Once you focused on the outside stuff, it's all there. It's awesome. Yeah. Now you're now you're rounded. Here we are in Washington, DC. They didn't clinch any deals today, but they've got work to do. Hickory, next stop. Hickory. Next Mikey stop. and Dwayne have an eBay purchase to check out. Oh shit. Being on the eastern seaboard in Washington, D.C., North Carolina was a short drive away. And North Carolina is where we actually had the 215 that we bought on eBay. Memorial Day weekend, probably the busiest weekend in America for travel. And we decided to go on a road trip. 
They'll soon find out whether the plane on eBay is really worth the $445,000 Joe paid for it. Mikey and Dwayne are on a recon mission. They're closing in on Hickory, North Carolina and about to find out whether the CL215 water bomber that Mikey bought off eBay is a great deal or a serious mistake. Now this is definitely a Buffalo first and this kind of shows we're moving into the future, you know, buying planes on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a risky move, spending almost a half million dollars for a water bomber without seeing it first. And we'll see uh, if we got a lemon or we got uh, some treasure. They've reached the airport earlier than planned, so no one is here to meet them. Holy smokes. I like that for eBay. She looks beautiful. A little dirty, but so am I. This thing is, uh, this thing is complete. She's all here. Precision engines on it. Landing gear. 1974. She's absolutely beautiful. She looks pretty clean. Well, we won't know what it really looks like until we open it up. It's locked, Mikey. It's locked from the... No. I don't even think those things can lock. I didn't think they could either. Want to go through the roof hatch? Think the roof hatch is open? Oh, that's got to be. I'll boost you up here. You just jump on the nose. Yeah. Just don't hit the wire and then... Yeah, I can get up there. Ready? Yep. Hang on, Mikey. We're good. No way. Yeah. How in the f did they do that? I don't know. So much for that. All right, so we're locked out. Mikey hasn't come all this way to be locked out of his new plane. Yeah, we can cut it off. Hello? Yep. Dwayne calls their North Carolina yep. contact. Okay, Mikey, open that cam lock there. Yeah, this one? Yeah, pull it off. Yeah, because there's a key inside here. You got a Phillips? No, nope. got a dime. Oh, shit. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, pull, pull. 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 Oh. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, hang on. Oh, look, yeah. Okay, Mikey, get her. You got her. There we go. No way. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Bring us in, son. Right on, Saigon. There we go. We are in. Bomb system's open. Looks good. Oh, zoot suits. Cockpit's complete. All right, away. Next step. Bring her home, man. But Mikey won't celebrate until he gets a couple of CL215 pilots to fly this duck home to Yellowknife for a closer look. It's still up in the air. No airplanes uh, have a good way of hiding uh, demons. Up in Yellowknife, Kelly Durasevich is on her way to the airport. Buffalo's former chief pilot, Arnie Schrader, and his family are arriving from Kelowna, British Columbia. I'm pretty excited to see them. I haven't seen them since they left Yellowknife, which was like a year ago. But a lot has changed. A year and a half ago, Arnie's daughter, Caitlin, underwent chemotherapy for cancer. Kelly and Arnie shaved their heads to support her. Last summer, Caitlin was pronounced cancer-free. But soon after, Arnie himself was diagnosed with the disease. I just hope I don't cry. God, I'm nervous. I don't know why the hell I'm nervous to see Arnie, but I am. Of course, I haven't seen him since he's been sick, you know, and he's lost a lot of weight. Arnie and his family are coming to Yellowknife to take part in a cancer research fundraiser. So I get to the airport and I was I was just so excited to see them. It'd been so long. Holy shit, I'm nervous. Oh. Hi! Oh my god. Oh my god. Good grief. I said I wouldn't cry. I was just so excited that they were like home. Oh, you look beautiful. Look at your hair. And then I asked, I said, where's Arnie? And hi, buddy. Oh. So good. 
it was really hard for me because I didn't recognize my buddy because he was like 130 pounds. You're just so skinny. I can't believe how skinny you are. Oh. 135 Jesus. It was a real shock to me because, I mean, of course, I've seen Arnie bald before when we shaved our head for Caitlin and stuff together, but not so frail. Holy, you sexy beast. Oh, my goodness. You look beautiful, buddy. Oh. Oh, I got chairs on the deck for you. Cold beer ready. Oh, yeah. For Kelly, just getting the chance to spend time with Arnie again is all that matters now. It's summer. Lake ice is gone. Time for float planes all over the north to come out of storage. Today, a lot of them are flying to Yellowknife for the Midnight Sun float plane fly-in. Even Joe's getting into the spirit. This is his 50th year of flying, and he's pulling out his classic 1940s Norseman for this year's event. The Nordine Norseman was designed and built in Canada, the first of its kind to sell abroad. It was tailor-made for the rugged conditions in the north. Between 1935 and 1959, only about 900 were built. Northern Canada was opened up by the Nordine Norsemen. It was the first time they were able to haul a huge load over a long distance. The Norsemen was used to move supplies to prospectors in remote corners of the north. It's how people got around, and it got into Joe's blood almost from conception. My mother riding around in the north and back and forth the Great Bear Lake with me in her, in her womb there, and, and uh, I probably could hear the, the, the sound of an Norseman engine through my biblical cord, and when it came down to me to be born, I, it stayed with me. Joe grew up in a mining camp at Gordon Lake, 80 kilometers from Yellowknife, and the Norseman was the camp's lifeline. Joe spent his childhood playing around those planes, and at age 17, he learned to fly. I learned to fly because I couldn't sing, I couldn't dance, baseball, I couldn't do it. I had two left hands, scared shitless of girls. So I learned to fly. She got a float. She got a float now. Yeah. When you climb into that airplane, and just the smell and sound of it takes you back to an era where you were, your life was very simple. You didn't have all the challenges that you manufactured in your life today. Joe's Norseman, registered as CFSAN, was actually a wreck when he bought it in 1993. He used parts from several other Norsemen to rebuild it. SAN is really six different Norsemen put together. It's like taking six of your kids and making one super kid. So as everyone gathers on Pilot's Monument in Yellowknife's Old Town, Joe and a lot of his Bush Pilot buddies do a flyover to honor these planes. Joe's legendary Norseman is the highlight of the event. And Joe's 50 years of flying the North is being recognized. So among you are a number of individuals who have sort of infiltrated the crowd. But there's one in particular that we'd like to single out, Joe McBrien, uh, the famous Buffalo Joe. Hey, folks, isn't that kind of cool? What I'd like to do is... Uh, Maybe a hand for the people that gave me this. This is really great. I don't get many presents. They want me to play with it. <laughs> we have been trying for two years to catch him, to present him with a duplicate model of his Norseman. He has had a very colorful, varied aviation uh, history, and we just love him. But Joe has his own idea of how to mark his half century in the air.
A special flight with a special guest, his granddaughter Hannah, to the place where his life and his love of aviation began. I'd like to fly that one. Well, come back this summer, she'll be yeah, yeah, on the water in a couple weeks. So. If I'm feeling good, I'll be back. Across town, another veteran bush pilot, Arnie Schrader, has his own float plane to get airborne. When he retired and moved away last year, he left behind his Cessna 180, currently on wheels. Your floats are over there on the trailer. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Like most northern bush pilots, Arnie's had a lifetime of adventures in this float plane. Just a few years ago, before he got sick, Arnie flew it out to a remote lake to help his friend Carl Clowder swap out an engine. That was gonna go your way, Dave. You know, he's been friends of uh, Joe's, mine, for years, so we're not gonna leave him out here in the bush. I'll go here and with Arnie. There's no hangar here, so these old bush pilots did it the old-fashioned way. First, they used tree branches as rails to slide the 400-pound engine out of Joe's Norseman. Look at that. There. Right on, guys. You have to use the materials that are available when you're out here in the, in the middle of the wilderness. You want it good and tight? Yeah. Okay. There, now you should be able to tighten it. That'll be good. Then they used the branches for a gin pole pulley system. Very normal uh, way of changing an engine out in the bush, eh? just want to tie them together with this one, Dave, and then, we'll use, then we'll use another. Yeah. yeah. Single engine airplanes will lose engines now and again. So, you know, I, well, in my lifetime, it's happened six or seven times. Swung out the old engine. Okay, stop. And swung in the new one. We're past the critical point. <laughs> we don't have the stamina we used to. We have the same attitude we used to. And I believe we've got uh, the same ability with much greater experience than we used to, so we're we're pretty good. You got her? We do is has it. <laughs> Great. It's either we're gonna hear a tremendous roar and it continues to run, or we're gonna hear a tremendous bang and it ceases to go. Yeah. She's gonna go. She's gonna go. Clear! Clear! Clear. And that's how it's done Northern Bush pilot style. Anyway, we better go. Cool. All right, thanks for coming out. Okay, no problem. For Arnie, an engine swap in the yeah. bush was old hat. Today, he's facing a completely new challenge, one that will take everything he's got. A big turn now, right? You see him? Yeah. There she is. A new water bomber arrives in Yellowknife. It's Buffalo's latest treasure, a CL215 the McBrien's bought on eBay. Oh, she looks beautiful. Open the door, Bert. After a two-day flight from North Carolina, it's made it to the Buffalo hangar. Ten oh eight. She was the eighth one ever built. This is probably the first time in a long time sitting in the airplane that somehow I wish I could just take it out for a rip. Mikey led the charge to buy the plane on eBay. He's starting to nudge Buffalo and Joe into the 21st century. It's pretty cool that uh, the boss is happy that we actually got something done because he really had nothing to do with it besides signing the check. From eBay to the front door, it's uh, it's pretty good. And now it's uh, up to the Buffalo crew to put her back in the air. In northern Alberta, the fires have finally burned out. But more than 700 residents of Slave Lake have been left homeless. The wind and Buffalo's water bombers helped divert the flames away from the Fort McMurray oil sands. For Scott, it was a dramatic introduction to water bombing, and it's changed the way he's thinking about his future. You don't have to go airlines to have success in this industry. I have no idea what's in store next, but 
so far so good, and it's been fun. We'll see what the future holds. While a young pilot looks to his future, a veteran pilot returns to his old stomping grounds for an important gathering. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome our 2011 Relay for Life Heroes of Hope. The Relay for Life, a fundraiser for cancer research, is about to begin. Arnie and his daughter Caitlin are here to take part. So, um, Caitlin's former team, the Funky Fairies, has no idea that she has traveled up from Kelowna to join them. Our friend who lives in BC now, she used to live here, Caitlin Stewart, um, she was 15 when she was diagnosed with cancer and she beat it last year. And yeah. she was a fairy with us last year. It's really good for Caitlin to come up here and her friends just loved every minute of it and it was just an incredible moment for everybody. It's been one year since Caitlin's cancer went into remission. Um, to be here with them is like they've, they've supported me through everything that has happened. Last year I had cancer so they were just like emotional support, people that I could talk to when I needed it. But now her dad, Arnie, is going through the same thing and only just recovering from his recent round of intense cancer treatments. Well, I uh, had uh, four chemo. That was uh, quite a few months ago. Then I had uh, radiation, you know, at the same time. It's pretty drastic stuff. They try to kill you to cure you, you know. The first lap of the relay is called the Survivor's Victory Lap. Arnie has come a long way to take this walk. You know, doing Arnie's walking by himself and the coordinator that did the Relay for Life seen me crying behind a truck, so she grabs me, she goes, go walk with him. Yeah, that'll help support me anyway. I don't do it. I don't do it. To do the walk with Arnie was an absolute honor. He's my best friend, his daughter's my best friend, his wife is, that's like my family, and I'm thankful that I have them in my life, and I'm thankful that Arnie's alive, and I got to do the walk of cancer with him. Arnie's tough, and he's gonna make it. He's our survivor, so I'm pretty proud. Really proud. <laughs> you look like an idiot. And I better hug him, just cause I love you. And I know he's gonna be okay, cause I'll make sure he's okay. He has to be okay. As a final stop on his trip, Arnie visits his old domain, the Buffalo Hangar. He loved flying for Buffalo. That's Arnie. Arnie's part of that. To me, Buffalo's not the same without him. And I know that all the young guys feel the same way. Well, I trained all these young guys. What it's all about, really, is to keep them alive, you know? And so, you know, I did that successfully for 25 years. After a life of flying, cancer has landed Arnie in uncharted territory. Well, I never experienced anything like that before. Just about didn't live through it three times, so I would say it's the toughest. After 50 years of flying, Joe McBrien is going back to where it all began for him. He's taking his granddaughter Hannah and his son Rod to the place where he grew up, a small mining camp on Gordon Lake. People must be lost if they can't go back home and, and walk their street again and look at the tree they used to swing from or the mailbox they used to rob or the milk bottle they used to pinch. But it's kind of nice to go back and look it all over and see how it all happened. Let me drift her in there. You got her. 
grandpa's house, sir. The house was built by Joe's father, who passed away this year at the age of 92. But see, everybody else built their cabinet of logs. And he was 22 years old when he built this. And he stood his logs up because they weren't long enough to lay down. Eh? Yeah. Everybody sort of gave him a bad time, but the greenhorn building his cabin crossways, but mm -hmm. it's still up. It seems that Joe's dad, like Joe, had his own way of doing things. That was like 70 years ago he built this cabin. Well, my parents and, and my grandfather were in the mining business, and, and they're, at that time, of course, it's in the 40s, and they're always chasing that elusive mother load. They didn't find any gold? They found quite a bit, yeah. Were there lots of people, Grandpa? Anywhere from 25 to 75 oh, yes. at a time. And this here was your great-grandmother's cookout. 15 years ago, there was still a lot left here. But another 15 years, you won't even be able to find this place hardly. As a child, Joe was already looking towards the sky and seeing his future there. I used to lay on this one over here. This one here, you could keep put your feet in the water and just lay here and let life go by. A lot of dreams were dreamt out here. We were the only two kids in this camp, it was Mary, my sister, and myself. Growing up here with the airplanes would be the same as the farm boy growing up on the farm. He's surrounded with his tractors, and at a very young age, he takes off and starts driving his, uh, the tractors, and that's um, really what it was like here. And it just seemed I was always in those airplanes going somewhere with those guys, and uh, they seemed to be um, the people that I looked up to wanted to be around, you know. They would give me lots of stick time and lots of knowledge about the airplane. Growing up in these camps, the airplane became very much a part of my life. My memories of being here are very, very good. Yeah. And uh, it was really neat to, to have grown up here. There you go. Just get yourself comfortable in there. Joe learned to fly on a plane exactly like this one 50 years ago. Since then, he's flown tens of thousands of hours and built an extraordinary airline. Sometimes a little envious of the young guys who, who are 20 years old and got, you know, 50 years ahead of them, and they're wasting it and just dinking around not paying attention. Uh, I wish they would pay more attention because I, I like to have, have another, another shot at it. Oh, yeah, I, the 50 years went by very, very, very quick. I, I never want to hear anybody say, I'm doing this to kill time because, boy, there's no time to kill. You gotta give her. And Joe has no plans to slow down. Just around the corner is another harsh winter for Buffalo. And more jobs, more challenges, and more aviation history to be made. <laughs>